The PGA Championship is here, and woo, buddy, do we have some storylines for this week. Scotty Scheffler on a heater, coming off a layoff, Rory McIlroy coming off a win, and going to the same course where he won his fourth major a decade ago. We've got all the live guys back in the fold, all the, the guys trying to break through on the PGA regulars, like Xander Schauffele, Justin Thomas. It's going to be a fun week at Valhalla for this week. We're going to break down our favorite bets and DFS plays for the PGA Championship on FanDuel for this week to get you ready for what should be a banger of an event. This is the Heat Check right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of FanDuel Research, joined here as I am every Tuesday by Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Cadula13. You can find his work at FanDuel Research, where he is a senior managing editor. Brandon, the PGA Championship is this week. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm very excited for this week's event. Um, I don't know if we're going to get like the Scotty Scheffler runaway. I kind of hope not. Like I am rooting for Scotty just to make history and just be yeah. a dominant force, but when he is dialed in it it does kind of you're just rooting for greatness at that point but if if he's a little bit more of a human this week is probably going to be really fun because we talked about this on covering the spread earlier but boy there are so many narratives this week yeah something's gonna someone's gonna like catch fire it's gonna be it just feels I feel like more excited for a PGA championship than I have in a long time. Yeah. It's like in a weird spot in the calendar where it's like kind of close to the masters. And so like, you don't get like a, a massive, massive buildup. Uh, there's that there's more of the weekend next weekend. So it's like in a weird spot in the calendar to get like super, super hyped. But for this year, because of all those fun narratives, I am having no issue getting up for this week. It should be a whole lot of fun. We're going to break down this year's PGA Championship, we'll let you know our favorite bets over at FanDuel Sportsbook for this week, and also talk about our favorite DFS plays on FanDuel as well. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the FanDuel Research Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. We're here every Tuesday breaking down that week's PGA events, talking our favorite bets and DFS plays over on FanDuel. That goes up on the FanDuel Research Podcast feed and on FanDuel TV Plus, also on YouTube for this week. Hello to the FanDuel YouTube page. Uh, leave us a thumbs up for the FanDuel YouTube page. You can find us on FanDuel TV Plus and the FanDuel Research Podcast feed each and every Tuesday to get you set for that week's PGA Tour event. Go search for FanDuel Research Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Hit subscribe, and if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating as well. Brandon also mentioned we uh, talked a PGA championship on covering the spread of this morning. That show already up on the FanDuel YouTube page, FanDuel TV Plus, and the Covering the Spread podcast feed as well. NBA, NHL playoffs coming up tomorrow. Uh, Preakness stakes on Thursday. We're going to talk some boxing on Friday. Uh, final week of the EPL as well. NASCAR All-Star Race, Formula One in uh imola this weekend so it's a jam-packed week in the sports betting calendar golf second major is here and you can bet on who you think will go home with the hardware on fanduel right now new customers get 150 dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar bet that's 150 bucks to use on outright winners finishing positions and so much more plus you get paid instantly when you bring home a major championship win this major season. So don't wait. Download America's number one sportsbook and swing for some green. Must be 21 plus or 18 plus in D.C. And president select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, D.C., Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Vermont, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700. Visit chaosgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org. Or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. 
Let's dig in now to the PGA Championship and break down what to expect for this weekend. It is going to be at Valhalla Golf Club, which is 7,609 yards and a par 71. Valhalla has hosted three previous PGA Championships, with the most recent one being back in 2014, where McElroy got the win there. There are 156 golfers in the field. The top 70-plus ties make the cut after two rounds. So 70-plus ties making the cut for this week. Key difference from previous or other PGA Tour events. Keep that in mind, as always. Brandon, when you look at Valhalla, obviously not a lot of traditional shot link data we can look at. But we can look back at least to 2014 and glean some stuff. So what should we know about this course before we fill out our bet slips and DFS lineups? Yeah, so it's a very long course. It's going to be the third longest on tour or you know, just play it. I mean, on on the PGA Tour, if you compare it to the other PGA Tour courses, um, third longest of the season. And you're going to need some driving distance. I don't know if there's a whole lot um, <clears throat> around that, basically. If you're short off the tee, you got to be dialed in with the long irons, approaches from 200 plus yards. But what I went ahead and did was pulled data from the 2014 PGA Championship. That's all we have. Really have just the cut makers in terms of the strokes gain data. So it is a small sample, but it also kind of tells us a little bit. And we can compare uh, Valhalla compared to other PGA Tour courses and see what kind of stands out. And <clears throat> one of the big things, I mentioned the distance. Uh, driving distance had a, co a stronger correlation at Valhalla in 2014 than what you get at your average PGA Tour course by a pretty you know, big margin. I'll spare most of the numbers here, but the correlation, so if you just knew driving distance, the correlation with strokes gained was 0.37. It's about a 0.16 you know, compared to the full PGA Tour schedule. Uh, and we saw the inverse, of course, with driving accuracy, a 0 0.08 um, at this course compared to a 0.26 in terms of the, you know, the regular PGA tour course. So much more emphasis on driving distance because of the overall distance, but we see that played out on a hole by hole basis. If you just run through each hole, look how long it is, look at other, you know, holes relative to par, you get a lot of long holes and not a whole lot of relief. There are just basically two holes that are substantially shorter then average relative to par, one being the 13th, which is a cool island green. So it's not even going to be like necessarily drivable. Um, so it's it's a lot of like it's going to be kind of relentless when it comes to the distance. And so that's why driving distance is going to be super, super important for me. But of course, again, I, I mentioned this already, but if the distance isn't there, you need approach play. You need long irons, but realistically, you need good irons in any major, but these greens are smaller than normal too. They're they're uh, five thousand square feet on average, according to the GCSAA, smaller than the PGA Tour average, which is usually a little over six thousand square feet. Going to be the third smallest greens uh, played this season on the PGA Tour uh, schedule. So distance, small greens, so you got to have the irons. And while we didn't see a big emphasis on putting or around the green play in 2014 when comparing it to the full tour uh, average we did see like we actually saw a little bit of a de-emphasis in around the green play putting about the same but putting does tell us a lot about scoring so you know it's a major and anyone who's ever seen us do a major show they know that i basically just reduced this down to the best golfers um the ones who just have the best strokes gain numbers adjusted for field strength uh, and recency, but overall, I need good ball strikers. I need length off the tee. I need strokes gain approach, and I need the putters. So I don't think there's a whole lot you can do poorly and still be in the consideration set for me, especially for betting when it comes to outrights. But there are a lot of names this week from a DFS standpoint, <clears throat> and <clears throat> frankly, in the middle, like the the nine thousand range this week tons of names tons of names that are intriguing to some degree so that's how i'm looking at it this week i don't want to overcomplicate it and i'm assuming we're going to be roughly on the same page there yeah we want distance and i think that's the key thing to emphasize here but i wanted to ask you um given that there are small greens we want 
we want approach. We want to emphasize that despite what, you know, like you said, from the data in 2020 or 2014, we want good approach players. Unfortunately, a lot of the best iron players, are not a lot. And I know the distance transits to the bag, but some of those guys who are really good at the irons are not going to gain distance off the tee. Uh, so I'm talking about like a, a Russell Henley type guy, Christian Bizet, no guys like that. Guys we talk a lot about here on the show. And even, even Corey Connors is not short, but he's also definitely not long off the tee either. How much of a downgrade do those guys get where they have a crucial import, a crucial component that we want with that good approach play, but they're going to struggle to keep up from a distance perspective relative to the field. So that goes back to, like you said, distance tends to translate throughout the bag, but data golf and their course fit tool is showing a much higher frequency of approach shot distribution expected from 200 plus yards this week, which makes sense based on how, you know, it's just a lot of long par fours. Um, but then also a par three that's going to play around 250. That is like a long iron territory. You can check out either the PGA Tour uh, stats website, so PGA Tour.com um, approaches from over 200 yards. They have that. Data Golf, though, also has their approach skill tool which you can check out and you can sort by a couple different things um, like strokes gained per shot, good shots from like certain distances. You can look through that and see, okay, who might be a little, if you're interested in golfers who might be a little bit shorter off the tee, are they still good with those long approaches? Frankly, you might be surprised sometimes where if you're short off the tee and you're on the PGA tour, you're playing well, you're playing well enough for us to consider. It's probably because you're pretty good on those long approaches that you're facing maybe a little bit more than other golfers who are longer. So you have resources. I'll try to cite that throughout the show. You know, most people that I am looking into roughly fit that, but if they don't they they might be long off the tee, but not great with that, with those long irons or, you know, vice versa. There might be someone who doesn't necessarily fit either, but they're just so good and so consistent yeah. elsewhere. But that's one of the biggest changes I think I'm making where in the past I might have, I don't like to look at super granular data because yeah. it doesn't always adjust for field strength or conditions or samples. The you know, PGA tour website's great, but you just get the full season. Thankfully with data golf um, and you don't have to be a member for it. No. Uh, for this tool, like you can look through past, you know, two years, last 12 months, et cetera, try to get a feel for who might be good on those long approaches. So again, I don't like to get super granular, but this week it's a major going to spend a little bit more time anyway. You know, any name you think is a little bit short off the tee, but you still like see how they check out in those stats. I think it's interesting. And it's important, too, that they're not cross off necessarily if they're not super long and just a downgrade. And that downgrade may be enough where you don't get to them, but like they're not cross offs like uh, data golf has a total stroke gained adjustment based on course fit. And that takes into account distance, all that stuff. And the loses 0.08 strokes per round based on course fit, which is bad, but also he's a really good golfer. So you can kind of afford to lose 0.08 and still be on the map somewhere while I get to him. I don't think I'm going to get to him, but like, you know, you're not crossing him off. Same thing with Henley. He's at negative 0.07. So keep that in mind, but it's not a, you, you must have distance uh, in every single golfer in your DFS lineup. You can't bet even a top 20 on a long, like golfer doesn't have distance, stuff like that. Just, it's important to keep in mind. There is uh it's not black and white here. Yeah. And like you mentioned Henley, he, mm -hmm. You know, look, we don't do a lot of course comp, like comparable courses stuff, but Quail Hollow is a good comp for Valhalla. That was what they played last week for the Wells Fargo. Henley was T10. He did not gain a lot of distance. He gained a bunch of fairways, hit his long irons or hit the irons overall well. T10. Like, it's not exactly the same, but golfers who are really good can overcome one thing. And it's like Russell Henley plays every course at a distance disadvantage. This is different than saying like, oh, buy in because he's short or something like that's not it. It's if you're good enough elsewhere, you can still be in consideration. So like you said, not a cross off, uh, but it is really appealing, I think, to have more and more stats uh, 
shout out to data golf for this oh, i frankly. think i just talked myself into a russell henley top 10 oh no <laughs> Oh, well, I, well, you you're a hey, you're you're always living in the top ten territory. I think a top twenty. Um, I'd have to look at the numbers there. I've got a top twenty will, for a different short golfer. So I don't mean like short physically, but like you know, not you long will. Off the tee. You will hear me recommend Russell Henley in the DFS section as a like. Okay, I might get to him before that. So, uh, so. winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay, let's talk about. There's no course history, like because that's. 10 years ago and golfers are very different. Rory seems kind of similar, but you know, a lot of golfers have changed since 2014. Nothing's changed in Rory's life in the past 10 years, uh, not in the past week either, but um, we can't look at PGA championship history because it does tend to be a lot of courses that have some similarities at least. So Brandon, you dug back into past PGA championships and looked at golfers who have done well in those specifically. So in this kind of setup, who has excelled, uh, based on the underlying data. Well, you might not believe this, but Brooks Kapka, yes, pretty, pretty good. Um, oh, there's more. Sorry, I got sidetracked. There's new data on PGA. I'm gonna have to check this stuff out. Oh wait, like sorry, website? I got distracted. Huh. On their leaderboard, I don't know if it's just for the PGA Championship, but their leaderboard looks kind of different. Um, but yeah, speaking of the PGA tour, you can also check out like past five event history at this event too, like with their field tool. Um, so shout out, you know, I want more golf data. I love it. We're living in, finally, we're starting to live in like the golden era of, of golf data, but let's talk Brooks Kepka, who has two wins over the last five PGA championships. Also a T2 for him. T55 and T29 as well. What's he been up to lately? Well, he did win uh, by two shots. His most recent live tour start um, was ninth at the event prior as well. When he won last year, he had two top tens leading in. I'm not, you know, there's only so much we can do when it comes to figuring out what these live guys are doing. But, we know that Brooks Kepka is long off the tee. We know that he can hit his irons really well, hit greens in regulation. I'm not even saying like pick up a ton of strokes approach, but hit greens in regulation and then two putt for par and move on whenever he needs to. So it's no surprise really that he's played the PGA championships. Well, uh, Justin Rose though also might not be as obvious, but uh, T9, T13, T8, ninth and T29 at the PGA championship. Scotty Scheffler has three top tens and a missed cut. Um, again, not surprising. Really, all these names I'm about to read are, are studs. Uh, Rory McIlroy, T7, 8th, 49th, 33rd, and 8th. He's golfing well. One here, of course, but I, that's not even factored in to the last five years to figure out who's got the best strokes gained average. Uh, Xander Schauffele, T18, T13, missed cut, T10, and T16. So four top 20s over the last Five years for my guy, Xander Schauffele. Love that for him. Dustin Johnson, while he is a stud long-term, we'll talk more about the recent form here in a second, but T55, missed cut, missed cut, but two top twos dating back four and five years ago. He won uh, in Las Vegas on the Live Tour in February, then was outside the top 20 in four straight Live events, did finish T7 in Singapore, but did miss the cut as well at the Masters with awful ball striking. I'm not there. Uh, I think his salary on FanDuel is like in the mid 9,000, mid, maybe upper 9,000s, but I'm not getting there. I just, you know, I'm just doing my, I'm just doing my job reading through the list here. He's 97. Uh, um, you know how it shows like FanDuel points per game for, mm -hmm. for golfers. He only has the masters, obviously negative 1.39 FanDuel points in that, uh, in that one game. Not great. Game in quotes, just for the yeah. audio people. I know it's not a game. Not a game. Not a game. We talking events. Uh, Shane Lowry, he's got a T12, T23, T4 over the last three years and was T8. Five years ago, Bryson DeChambeau, uh, two two top fives with a missed cut um, in there, but that's pretty appealing for Bryson, who's been T26 and T27 at Adelaide and Singapore and the Live Tour, respectively. 
but really just one bad round among those six. He had five straight top tens prior. I think that's appealing. Uh, surprise, surprise. Big P, Patrick Reed. Uh, T18, T34, T17, T13 for him. Uh, was T12 at the Masters. Uh, T22 at Adelaide. T14 at Singapore. Uh, after two top tens prior to the Masters, he always seems to be lurking. Seems like he really cares about these majors. Uh, but just uh, two more names here quickly. Victor Hovland, T2, T41, T30, and T33 for him. Did miss the cut at the Masters, T24 at the Wells Fargo, but was top 20 or top 15 rather in both of the ball striking stats. I think we're all kind of waiting to see with Victor Hovland. I think he was one of your win picks last week, even maybe not, yeah, but you were considering that was, him. That was not an actual bet. That was a that was a win yeah, pick for the for show. The, I'm yes. not on him at all this week, personally. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then Colin Morikawa, you know, a win for him, T8, T55, and T26. He's coming in with three straight top 16s in his stroke play events, was T3 at the Masters. Again, one of those golfers who is not long off the tee, but we know that he can kind of, like in in theory, hits his long irons really well. The data is not quite as impressive from over 200 yards, so... I'm not out on him, but I don't necessarily like him as much as I typically do. And I will just shout out Will Zalatoris, who's got two top tens and his only two starts. Usually I look at golfers with at least you know two to three starts, but this week uh, to account for volume, I did total stroke scan, not per round. So shout out to Will Zalatoris as well. A uh, question for you. I've had the Wyndham Clark theory of betting for the past year, where if he's 80 to one, you bet him. And mm-hmm. I thought that was Wyndham Clark specific. Will Zalatoris is 80. Um, <laughs> he's shown upside at some recent events. Uh, didn't did withdraw before uh, the it was an event in Texas, which uh, was the RBC Heritage. I don't know. He withdrew before a recent event and then played at the Wells Fargo. Didn't look very good at the Wells Fargo. Does it make him a cross off or does the spike week potential for Zalatoris making a consideration when it seems like nobody will be on him? Well, it's not, it's not in either, like, it's not a, is he a cross off because of the injury concerns or because nobody's on him? You should like bet him. Uh, well, nobody's not on, on him, which means his odds are long. That's what it means. Yeah. 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 I don't think they're long enough necessarily. Okay. However, that's when I model things out. If I were a more subjective, better, and just f- a feel based, you know, had a feel based process, looked in, saw the irons be pretty good long term until the Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. Um, And then took a step back. Sure. I think the biggest concern for me, not not just the putting, but his distance isn't great. Yeah. And that's a little bit of, hey, Will Zalatoris is one of the best golfers on the planet when healthy because he nukes it and hits his irons well. And then in spite of not being a great putter, if the putting's iffy, the distance isn't there. I think it's too many things for me yeah. to want to get to. Are you thinking more an outright because he's 80 to 1 or top 10, top 20 because every, I want to take advantage of volatility. I don't want safety. It's It'd be about volatility. And I, I, I don't think, a, well, a top 10 is not safety. No, you're, right. That's, you're, right. you're right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the distance point is good because that's the one thing he has not gotten back post injury, post back injury. And when you add in the withdrawal, I think he's he was worth like discussing, but I agree, probably not long enough to draw us in. But let's talk about Scotty Scheffler and Roy McElroy. You talked about them as being guys and Xander Schauffele too, with good PGA championship history. So the top of the board has done well in this event. Had they done well enough to bet them? Let's talk Scotty and Rory first, and then thoughts on Xander at 14. Uh, so, again, this is the difference of like modeling things or the feel based. With Scheffler, it's easier. My model has him pretty close to, to a fair value at four to one. I'm not quite there. However, that process has uh, failed me in four of his last five starts. I'm not recommending betting someone because of victories and not wanting to miss out. That's not what this is. It's for the past four or five events he's been in. I said, I'm almost there, but not quite. 
Mm-hmm. And I get it if you want to roster or you want to bet someone rather who has four wins in his last five starts, you are going to have to pay a bit of a premium. Even with that factored in, he's really not that like it's still in consideration for me. Yeah. As for Rory, it's a little bit harder for me. I think the odds are noticeably shorter than they should be in part because of the win last week in part because he won here 10 years ago. I want to root for Rory. I will root for him. I just can't get there myself. Now Xander is really appealing. I talked about him a lot on covering the spread. I'm going to talk about him in the DFS section. Also going to talk about him still in the upcoming bet section, but you can't, point to a single thing about him and dislike it other than the fact that he has not converted wins. Everything looks in Xander's favor. And for people who don't necessarily know, he's been adding distance, adding ball, you know, ball speed, club head speed. Things are improving for him in that front. And I talked about that 200 plus range. He is in a tier of his own in terms of stroke skin uh, per shot from that range over the last year. I've been on Xander a long time. Uh, this is not necessarily a week where I, want to, where I want to move away from that. I agree. I, I already bet him. We'll talk about why uh, in the betting section later on. But first, let's talk about current form. Golfers who are entering this event with noteworthy form either one way or another. So Brandon, when you look at the data, who stands out uh, entering this week's event? So I like to look at the last three months. Um, and the true strokes gain numbers from data golf, which does account for field strength. So it helps a ton. Um, and then typically I look at golfers with salaries of 10,000 or lower on FanDuel to get us a feel for who maybe might fly under the radar, but then I also it sort of translates into the betting market. But before I do that, I just want to shout out Scotty Scheffler, who in this span is at a 3.93 and Xander Shoffley is second at a 2.87 with nobody else above a 2.56, which is Hideki Matsuyama. So to clarify, Scotty's a shot better per round than anybody else over the last three months. That's how good he's been. That's why he's four to one. I get it. Um, That's awesome. But for golfers who do fit my typical criteria, I'm going to start with Joaquin Neiman right at 10,000 on FanDuel. He is at a 2.21 true strokes gain per round in this span. That is a top five number in this sample. We know that he is long off the tee. We know he's a good uh, iron player, if not a great iron player. He's got a win in five top tens in his last six starts on the live tour and the Asia tour combined with T22 at the masters with subpar putting very appealing 35 to one as well. I think we'll, probably talk about him in the betting section if i'm not mistaken so it's the past three months which i believe if my math is correct that lops off his win at mayakoba on the live tour and also lops off his win at the australian open on the dp world tour so you're not even cherry picking his best sample and he's still very very good in that span uh he has yeah like he had the win at Jeddah. Yeah, that's but like yeah, yeah. It, it's that that span cuts off his my his two of his other wins. He's a freak. Yeah, I love I love Neiman. Yeah, it's it's really appealing. Um, yeah, I think you kind of I don't say burned a lot of people, but he was getting a lot of hype leading into the Masters. And you know, I'm back again, baby, though I don't care. Uh, sometimes I'll get annoyed when I get burned, but not this week. Oh, will baby. you? I never in. noticed. Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> I just like I just like running back the exact same betting card from the Masters with Neiman and with Xander. What could go wrong? That went so well. Why not run it back again? It is it is um it is a bit peculiar, especially when you're recommending things like week in, week out, where it's like Russell Henley, Xander, saw hit, like the same guys week in, but it's the process over the past year plus with all the adjustments factored in. Oh, surprise, surprise. Those golfers are going to stay toward the top of like my model. They're um, good golfers and they keep doing well. <laughs> Sorry. But, so no, no, I, I, but like, I'm there with you, but yeah, uh, yeah. Yep. one name that we have not had exposure to uh, is Sebastian Soderberg, 
whose salary is 7,700. He's at a 1.81 true strokes gain per round over the last three months on the DP World Tour. Uh, T21, T2, solo second, and T3 for him. Neutral distance, no real shot link data in that span. Uh, you know, very minimal, I should say. Uh, but great iron play back in January and February. If you go to the last 50 rounds for golfers, um, on data golf's true strokes and query, he's 18th in approach. Big question marks elsewhere. However, we don't know if he's ironing those things out, like without the shot link. I'm probably not going to get there, but this is why we do this section. I think he, you know, maybe that, maybe that does something for you. I don't know, but probably not enough for me with other golfers in the 8,000 range who I would trust more, including Alex Doran, who I know not the same salary, 8,900, but like him, you know, pretty often he's at a 1.7 in this span. He's got seven straight top 25s on the PGA tour with great T to green numbers, sort of neutral to poor distance. Don't want to overwrite that. Um, but still a great long-term golfer. Uh, Tiro Hatton, 9,800. He's at a 1.65 in this span. T9 at the Masters, 4th, 15th, and 5th in his last three live starts. Russell Henley, talked about him already. Going to talk about him more. 10th at Wells Fargo. Again, a course that plays pretty similar to this one this week. T12 at Heritage, 4th uh, at Valero. And then in between that, T38 at the Masters. No, he's short off the tee, but solid enough result at the Masters. Top 10 last week at a similar course. I uh, see Woo Kim, another shorter hitter, 9,300, but good form overall. Three straight top 20s. And uh, his last missed cut came back in October. T30 at Augusta, another long course uh, with, you know, quick bent greens. Just throw that out there. Uh, Akshay, ba uh, Akshay Batia, 9,000, uh, 42 or sorry, 42nd at Wells Fargo after winning the Valero was T35 at the Masters as well and T18 at the RBC Heritage. And then just rattling off the bottom three here on the list, these are all the golfers with a 1.4 or better uh, true strokes gain per round uh, average over the last few months. Denny McCarthy, another short hitter, but can spike because of the putter. Sahith Tagala, who I'll talk about more uh, later, another spike week guy. And then Harris English, who kind of, his distance is better than probably perception. The, the, the putting is pretty good. The irons are just really up and down, but his salary is only 8,500 this week. So again, a lot of, a lot of value options this week. Does anyone on that list jump out to you that you want to talk about more? I want to ask you about Hatton because we obviously have not seen him for a bit because he is on the live tour. Now I did see him at the masters, as you mentioned, uh, finished in the side, the top 10 there. And Hatton, like, if you look at the overall numbers, does not have distance, but he can have distance when I, I think when he wants to, because at the Masters, he did gain distance on the field there, and he's done that in some other events as well. So I find him pretty interesting. The one problem I run into with Hatton is that he's in a really loaded tier. He's $9,800 on FanDuel for this week, and as we typically have for a a major championship, that's a good range. Joaquin Neiman is at 10000 Justin Thomas, a little bit of a hometown narrative or home-ish town narrative at 98, uh, same as Hatton. And then Tony Fina, the putting's bad, but as we talked about other stuff, getting better for him. Shane Lowry here is here. Scythe's here. I don't hate Sam Burns. Uh, Byung-Hun An is 94 as well. So loaded range. How are you viewing Hatton at 98? Pretty interesting. He's got two straight uh, top 15s at PGA Championships as well. Uh, five total top 25s, just two missed cuts over just ballparking at like eight or nine starts um, at the PGA Championship. Don't hate it. And speaking of hate, I mean, he hates Augusta. He makes that known <laughs> and played well. Um, I, I think that was I, the site of uh, the Muppet video where... Um, he was like in the clubhouse and um, Ian Poulter was like, we played like a bunch of Muppets today and they were like 13 over at the table and Hatton was one of them. I think that was at Augusta. So he's away from the Muppet venues. So I think we're good. Non-Muppet narrative bump for Tyrrell Hatton this week. All right. Putting you want to play notes. a quick game? Uh, yeah. Hatton or Neiman? Oh, Neiman by a mile. Hatton or Matt Fitzpatrick? Um, let me look. 
All right, <laughs> never mind. Never mind then. It, if you have to look them all up, then it's not worth it. Well, just a second. Um, <laughs> Are we talking like at salary slash at betting odds or in general? Well, we're well. You you mentioned like the nine thousand range. I figured uh, I'm taking Hatton passwords. over my guy Fitz. Uh, Hatton or Spieth? Hatton. Hatton or JT? S- JT. Yeah. Do you agree with all those or no? I think so. Okay. I might go cool. Fitz, but that's just a, I'm a Fitz nerd, I think as well. So. As you should be, go Cats. Okay, weather for this weekend. The worst winds will be Friday afternoon, but even those will be pretty calm at 8 miles per hour. But there's a chance of rain the entire day Friday. So it's uncertain which wave will benefit because I don't really know. There could be an advantage, but who can say who will benefit? I can't, that's for sure. So you could consider like wave stacking, but I don't know which one will benefit because it's tough to predict when there will be delays. And it looks like thunderstorms, so there probably will be delays on Friday. So. I don't know who will benefit. You can wave stack if you want, but I know it's not the best advice, but it is what it is. And then pretty calm with a chance of rain over the weekend, so not massive considerations for weather for this week. Let's take a look at the betting odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook and outline where we see value for this week from an outright perspective. First, Brandon, beginning there, what are your favorite bets for this week over at FanDuel Sportsbook? I like Xander Schauffele at 14-1 to to win the 2024 PGA Championship. I'm in. I think a lot points to Xander. Um, I know he doesn't win, etc. I don't believe in that. I think a lot is pointing to, again, this this is far away from like, quote-unquote, guaranteeing. It's like, oh no, he's due, this is going to happen. But here are all of the reasons that Xander makes sense. First of all, he's a phenomenal golfer. And I mentioned this already, but over the last three months, only Scotty Scheffler is better than Xander. And frankly, over the last 50 rounds, he's second to Scheffler. 12 months, he's behind just Rory and Scheffler. He deserves a lot of attention. And... There's much more. I mentioned that I want approach play from 200 plus yards. Xander is the guy from that range over the last year by a pretty big margin, um, like 0.3 shots, like 0.3 strokes gain per shot over a large sample than anyone else, which is pretty wild among golfers with like relevant, like enough of a sample there to be considered. Um, Mentioned that he's gaining speed. Gaining distance, love to see that. And you know, I like to look at putting regression. Xander Schauffele from within 15 feet, 89th percentile on tour this season in terms of those more makeable putts. Love to see that. But 10th percentile outside 15 feet, which you can say it's because he can't lag putt, or you can say it's because he hasn't really had anything fall in despite being a great putter. That's the one I'm going to go with because that's usually how this works. So my model shows value on Xander. I understand it if you're not quite there. I don't know how you look at his profile, though, and say, like, you don't like him. I understand saying don't necessarily like him to win. But there is, uh, you know, the finishing position markets. He's plus 140 to finish as a top 10 under that no laying up specials tab there. And you can also go with. Xander without Scotty Scheffler at 11 to one. So I like him a lot. I don't have anything. I don't think you can really say anything bad about him. Yeah, I'm there as well as Xander. So let's just talk about that right now as well. And we had this discussion a bit on covering the spread this morning, but I think that that club speed discussion is pertinent because I think that previous criticism of Xander for not winning was valid because he wasn't generating spike weeks. And if you want to beat a field like this, you need to gain, you know, five strokes on the field per round, basically, in order to win an event like this. And Xander doesn't do that a whole lot. Like he's consistently in that two to three range, but you don't see a lot of fives on the ledger. But you do get more of those recently. And I think that's enticing. And I'm curious, like, let's say hypothetically Xander does what he did Thursday, Friday on Saturday, Sunday instead. 
Like he does, he plays the way he played this weekend on Thursday, Friday, and then goes bananas over the weekend. Is he 12 to one? Where, where does he settle in for the betting markets? If that happens, like if we flip his four rounds this past weekend. Yeah, but still didn't win probably 12. Yeah. Like, I think he's shorter than what he is. I think so. so too, yeah. Yeah. So like gaining distance off the tee, which increases his volatility in a good way. He can have spike weeks elsewhere, which we've seen. Like it wasn't, he wasn't generating spike weeks off the tee. He was generating them with approach and putting, but now he can do so off the tee too. Like last week he gained point or 1.66 strokes per round off the tee per day to golf. That's pretty sick. So I, I am in this week. I know I've like gotten frustrated with him, but I don't think that is enough to justify me forsaking what I think is legitimate value at 14 to one. So like, yeah, I think the criticisms previously were decently fair because he was like not volatile enough, but that volatility has increased. And I think that that gives him the upside we want in a field like this. So I'm in at Xander at 14 to one this week. Good. I'm glad. But if Xander doesn't do it for you, you can go with pretty much the guy who is the antithesis of Xander, where the data doesn't make sense, but he wins <laughs> all the time in these big events. And that's Brooks Kepka, who is now 16 to 1. He was 14 to 1 earlier on Tuesday. Look, again, all of like the the modeling, the math, sustainability love Xander Brooks Kepka is he's been hard to model forever because of the way that he plays in majors. And it's not even that he, it's not just that, Oh, he plays better. He's basically says he plays a different game in majors. He doesn't pin seek. He just tries to hit the green, make par when he needs to and doesn't overcomplicate it. So like weirdly that safer play increases his volatility when it comes to majors because he's not really making mistakes. So he's like more volatile by being more consistent. It, like, I know it doesn't make sense what I'm saying, but it does make sense as well. So uh, I'm going to stick with it, but he's got three PGA championships already. One last year, he came in off of a solo third and a fifth on the live tour. This year he's coming in uh, off of a win and a T nine. So we don't have a ton to go off of when it comes to the live tour other than really driving distance. That's about it, but it's still good for Brooks. And when it comes to majors, I don't look, I talk about my model, all of the data, et cetera. If Brooks is like healthy and playing good golf, it's really not a bet like you're going to regret making if you want to, like if you're almost there. So for me, Brooks at 16 to one, especially now that he's longer, um, he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily appear as a value in my model. Cause it's so difficult to account for him unless you just change his projections, his data. And I don't do that. Um, so this one's more of a subjective situation. Yeah. However, I could still fully support it with, again, the good finishes, the distance being there. And of course, it's also just kind of hard to overcomplicate Brooks at a major. Yeah, I, I love models and numbers as much as you do. But I think that it's important to recognize the spots where they may struggle. And they struggle with a guy who literally says he's a different mindset. Like he has said this. This is not conjecture. It's him saying, I don't care as much. Like in a non-major event, which like, why would he? Uh, so I, I get it. So I think that backing Brooks 16 to one, like you said, probably not going to regret that. And I think that's a fair way to view things for sure. For me, the non Xander outright that I like for this week is going to be on Joaquin Neiman. I was on him for the masters and the finish was not there for Neiman at the masters, but he did play pretty well in that event, basically just lost some strokes in the greens and I feel like we can buy back in once again. I haven't seen a lot of reason to jump off of Neiman, finished third and seventh in the two live events since Augusta. The distance for Neiman has always been good, but it's been especially good since basically January 1st. Uh, he should play pretty well at Valhalla, considering the distance, considering how good the irons are. Now, the one downside for Neiman is the track record in majors is not great, but again, 
I think he's more volatile in the positive sense golfer now than he was in previous years. So we haven't seen Neiman's upside in a major in his current form just yet, but I think we saw glimpses of it at Augusta, given how good the ball striking was there. So when Neiman is down at 35 to one, I think there is betting value there. So I like Neiman a lot at 35 to one willing to bet him for this week. Brandon, you talked about Neiman as well on covering the spread this morning. What puts you on Neiman as a consideration at 35 to one? Uh, pretty much everything you said. Uh, he's got distance. He he was always one of the best ball strikers on tour. Um, whenever he was like racking up rounds and rounds and rounds. And that's why we always liked him for, for DFS, for betting. Uh, and it's still kind of there, but we're also getting a good number on him because people were kind of saying sort of, at least hopefully like kind of joking that he was the best golfer in the world leading into the masters, et cetera. Not really hearing much. I don't think the round thoughts now. were, were joking that that might've been serious from them. <laughs> um, but it's a good number. You're not really hearing that hype and the case isn't really any different. So it yeah. goes back to that. Like, Oh, we liked him for the masters. What's changed like a month that's about it like it's still it's still the same process yeah. uh it's a it's a somewhat similar course where you need distance good irons putting um so it would be i would be more worried if we didn't like neiman again but nothing changed like nothing's changed with him really so yeah. i'm still there as well i yeah. like that Okay, so outrights this week. Brandon likes Xander Schauffele at 14 to 1. Brooks Kepka 16. I like Xander Schauffele also at 14 to 1. And then Joaquin Neiman at 35. What about non outrights? Where do you see value there this week, Brandon? Yeah, it's a major. And I I love a good long shot as much as anyone, but this one especially feels loaded. It feels like one of the sharks is going to go out and, and get it. So I don't want to get too far down the odds board when it comes to the outrights. Uh, Another live name, though, that I think makes sense, Bryson DeChambeau to finish top 10 uh, was plus 260 earlier. It's now plus 270. I'm fine with that. The length is there. We know that for Bryson. It's like the one constant for him. And the live form is still good enough to want to buy in. He's another golfer. Really, all the live guys, which is not super surprising. Like All the live guys are hard to sort of model out at this point. We just don't have a lot of data. Uh, but if you dig back to his past two finishes, you'll just see a T27 and a T26. But he played pretty well um, in those in terms of scoring. Setups relatively easy, but five good rounds there uh, <laughs> among the two. But before that, uh, four top tens leading into the Masters when he finished T6. Nuked the ball off the T still. Great approach play. And if you want to go with like the course comp quail hollow narrative, he played that course pretty well. It was T33 in the PGA Championship in 2017 there. Uh, had a top 10 uh, in 2021 and a, a top five in 2018 at a similar course. So I think Bryson makes a lot of sense. My final one here is going to be Sahith Thagala to finish top 20 at plus 220. Uh, he is one of those golfers who is long off the tee, but he's a 90th percentile approach player from 200 plus yards over the last calendar year in terms of strokes gained per shot. You want to talk spike weeks? You know, maybe it's a little bit, I don't want to say even cautious with a top 20, but a top 10 is, that's still, that's a lot of upside. That's one or two shots away from, top 20, top 10, those types of things. It's going to, I think it's going to be a really crowded leaderboard, but I have value on Sahith outright as well. He did shorten from 75 to 70, still see a little bit there, but in terms of what I'm recommending here, I see value on him to finish top 20 still at plus 220. Okay, so Sahith top 20 plus 220 and Bryson DeChambeau top 10 plus 270. To clarify, those are in the finishing position markets of FanDuel Sportsbook. They do have a market where you can bet where there are no uh, dead heats. So you can bet the top X finish, including ties market. If you want that, personal preference is to deal with dead heats. If they land at the exact same number and I have to pay out a dead or get a, a smaller payout because of dead heats, so be it. I think that's a worthwhile endeavor. So I'm glad they're offering it. It's good to have choices, but personally going to go with the ones where 
your payout could be reduced because of a dead heat. So let's talk my one indulgence bet of the week, Brandon. Um, that's on Wyndham Clark to finish inside the top 10. Now, I know I was on Clark last week. Did not go great. Uh, held out hope for that first round where he was making birdies, making double bogeys, going full bizarro stuff. But he's plus 360. And if you look at the overall numbers for Wyndham there, I know the irons weren't super, super sharp early on. But it was mostly because the short game was off for Wyndham in that event. The irons and the driver were still fine. He has a distance to do well at this course. Um, he has three top fives and signature events this year, not counting the win at Pebble Beach. He was third at the Tour Championship. He put it pretty poorly in his debut at Augusta to miss the cut, and it was his debut at Augusta, so pretty willing to overlook that. His implied odds for a top 10 are 21.7%. I think I should do it. So I'm going to go with the Wyndham Clark top 10. He's not 80, so I can't bet him outright. Like Again, I, I violated the rule last week, should not have done that, but we'll go with the top 10 plus 360 here. Mentioned before I talked myself into a Russell Henley top 10. We're doing it, baby. That is seven plus 750 at FanDuel Sportsbook for this week. And the distance for Henley is a negative. But as you mentioned when we were in that section, the distance is bad for him everywhere, and yet he still puts up really good finishes in tough fields. 10th at the Wells Fargo, an elevated event, uh, this or designated event this past week. 12th at the RBC Heritage, another designated event there. He was oh, fourth at the Valero, not designated, but like uh, fourth at the Arnold Palmer. Uh, fourth at the Sony Open in Hawaii. He puts up good finishes in tough fields. And we've seen that in majors too, in events where distance mattered. Uh, like at LACC last year in the US Open, he finished 14th there, didn't lose a ton off the tee in terms of distance when he really needed to have some giddy up, and then was also fourth at Augusta last year. So I know it's a negative to have his distance, but you know, it's it's plus 750 for a top 10. I'm willing to go there for Russell Henley for this week, given how good the non off the tee parts of his game are. So I'll take Henley for a top 10 plus 750. The one where I will kind of shy away from being aggressive and not go towards the top 10, instead go towards the top 20 is Lucas Glover. That seems like a, a, a step too far, even for me to go <laughs> Glover inside the top 10. So we'll instead go with Lucas Glover to finish inside the top 20, which I'm still scrolling over at FanDuel Sportsbook, still scrolling. Is it still plus 600? Yeah, it's still six to one, which is 14.3% applied for Glover for a top 20. Um, he's had a top 20 in four of his past 10 majors. That does include a, a dead heat 20th at the Masters. So, you know, taking that count too. Uh, but Augusta values distance. His irons are fully dialed in right now. So I will go Glover for a top 20 at six to one at FanDuel Sportsbook. So non outrights for me are going to be Henley top 10 plus 750, Glover top 20 at six to one, and Wyndham Clark top 10 plus 360. Brandon, thoughts for you? I don't want to ask you about Wyndham. I don't want to hear your thoughts there. But thoughts for you on Henley uh, top 10 and Glover top 20. Well, I, I talked about Henley. I like him for DFS a lot. Um, I do see value on him. Uh, at plus 750 for the top 10. I'm a little more, when it comes to the finishing positions, I kind of look first if there's value on the top 20. And if there is, I'm okay going that route. He's plus 280. I think that definitely checks out as well. Uh, but Glover, I think, is a good call. He is a name I considered for the covering the spread uh, show, but I went with Patrick Rogers, who was plus 650 to top 20. He's now plus 550. I had him around. He was 6 to 18 one. to one for a top 10 and he shortened to 14 and I was crestfallen before the show. So it's I fresh. didn't really come up with uh, many long shot, like quote unquote long shot finishing positions, but Glover was in that consideration set for me because of look, anytime you get a really, really great T to green player, and you go to a tough setup like this, I think you can make that case. But my model shows some value there too. So um, Glover 6-1 to, to top 20, I think, is, is a great call. All righty. Let's boogie that in advance to the DFS section for this week and talk about our building blocks over on FanDuel.com from a DFS perspective for the PGA Championship. Brandon, let's start things off with you. Who are your core plays on FanDuel DFS for this week? Hesitating now. Why? Because I don't really envision building one, if I build one lineup, it's got to have Scotty Scheffler in it. Really? So I think by default he has to At be a low thirteen two. Yeah, you can do it. 
Yeah, you can I do can, it, especially but... if you go down to like Joaquin Neiman as your, your second, second golfer. Okay, you're gonna have one golfer short than 35 to one to win this week in a DFS lineup. <laughs> I want to get darts, about baby. Eight, to get about 18 percent of the win equity though from one guy. I'm saying you can use him, but like if I have you can one play lineup, Xander and Rory. And according to my numbers, get less than fourteen percent of the wins, or you can roster Scotty and get over eighteen percent. But Xander's seventy five percent to win. So what do you mean? What are you talking about here? Okay, okay, you're gonna do that. Math. What's wrong with okay, your math? I'm gonna all right. I'm gonna leave Scotty as a like because it does put a lot of constraints on you. Yeah. Come so on. my first love will be Xander Schauffele. Okay. Um, okay. I wanted to talk through it though. It's I don't want us to like gloss over how great a play Scotty Scheffler is just yeah. because he's a little bit hard to roster. I think it's an easy mistake to make and there are no guarantees in golf or anything like that, but 18% win equity. Come on. Like well, that, that's ridiculous. But Xander has a great play style for every course. He, he tees it up at, especially majors. He's been top 20 in four of his last five PGA championships. You don't need him to win, which there's probably great news for, for no, some people. Yeah. Um, I think that he's got a probably a better case now than ever before with everything trending in that direction. If not for Scotty Scheffler, like being there, but uh, he's the, actually the only golfer in the field to be top 20 in all four strokes game categories over the last 50 rounds. According to data golf. I love that Xander. I will start my lineups with him and feel good. I would love to get to Scheffler, but um, Xander, much more of a realistic starting point for me. Uh, Joaquin Neiman at 10,000 is another love of mine. Great salary for his profile. I know we both like him at 35 to one. You named him specifically as someone that you like, that you want to bet at that number. And I think the shine is wearing off a little bit. Uh, again, he was really hyped up entering the masters, not hearing that quite so much. Um, cause you know, four weeks is a, is a long time for, and then people, you know, start looking at other places, but he's got plus distance. He's third in that uh, stat over the last 50 rounds. Great overall ball striker form is more than good enough for a $10,000 salary. So I like that a lot. Uh, third and final love for me will be Sahith Thagala at 9,500. He is 32nd in approach play over the last 50 rounds, 36th in distance. So the ball striking checks out. He's ninth in putting over the last 50 with 75th percentile putting splits from within 15 feet on tour this season. That's basically the checklist this week. Distance, good irons, great putter, spike week potential. It might not work out, but it also could be there and it's all accounted for in a salary of 9,500. Yeah, I think all those guys are firm considerations uh, for me, and I like all of them. So the 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 loves for you, Xander Schauffele at 11.4, Joaquin Neiman at 10,000, Sahithi Gala at $9,500. I think that if I'm saying to you right now, like, who is the one guy you are locking into your lineup? I kind of think it's actually Neiman for me. Like, I think Neiman might be the first guy I put into a lineup at 10,000. Is that outrageous to, to prioritize him over others? I don't think it's outrageous. He does stand out. You know, I'm not going to play the game because it put you under a lot of pressure last time. <laughs> no, do it. Let's do it. Come on. Fire me. Here we go. Um, We'll go up to, we'll go up to Victor Hovland at 10, six Neiman at like, we'll do at salary for DFS go in Neiman. Neiman Bryson DeChambeau. Neiman. 10, Neiman. Yes. Hideki Neiman at 10, four. He's in good form. I will shout yeah. that out. But he Cam just withdrew because eight. he was sick, therefore, and he burned, not me, but some DFS players, therefore, he is dead to us. Uh, Cameron Young at 10 3. Neiman. Tommy Fleetwood at 10 2. I like Fleetwood, but I like Neiman more. Mm -hmm. And Will Zalatoris at 10 1. Neiman. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. So Neiman to me is the number one guy. It's the distance, it's the salary. The salary is really low at 10,000, which helps a lot. Um, so I think this is a great spot to go to Neiman. If I had to pick between betting him outright or playing him in DFS, DFS. now that he's 35, I might actually prefer him in DFS. I like him in both, but I, th I think he's slightly better DFS play, but I like both. My other love at the top is Rory McElroy. Um, this is part of why I was willing to push back on Scotty a bit at 13 too, is because Rory is... <laughs> 
come on. He's $1,100 lower salaried. Absolutely bombs it off the tee, which I love. He's played this course and won at it, which doesn't, you know, move the needle a ton, but it definitely does not hurt. And you're getting the irons. You're getting killer Rory right now. I think there's enough here. So I can say with a decent amount of confidence that my head to head against you is probably going to have Rory McIlroy in it at 12 one. It's going to have Neiman for sure. But I think it's going to have McIlroy at 12 one. Now we know you're on Scotty. Uh, but what is your view of Rory in DFS specifically at 12 one? I like Rory. I'm not saying he's a bad play. And yes, I understand that $1,100 is a lot, but it doesn't actually reflect the gap to me between the two. Right. Because Scheffler the gap is smaller. Is like, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Scheffler is like 10 percentage points more likely to win over the last 50 rounds. That's like your opinion. Uh, he it, <laughs> is it? Did Scotty win last week? <laughs> Over the last 50 rounds, Scotty has a 1.14 strokes gain per round advantage over Rory. I like Rory. I am fine with Rory, but I would rather find $1,100 for the rest of my lineup to get so much more win equity, so much more long-term success. Have you considered the narratives though, Brandon? Come on. Oh my gosh. It's tough to do a, a Rory Shoffley Neiman build, it but is. I will dink around with it for sure. I think it's it's worth looking into. I initially had Bryson as a love. I'm going to downgrade him to a like. Uh, so, okay. I think that that's that's what I'll do there. I'm going to wind up having f- four likes then, but whatever. I think that's uh, that's the way it breaks down. So my li- loves this week are Neiman and Rory. Uh, your loves are Sahith, Neiman, and Xander. Xander should probably be a love for me. The more I think about it. He's not even a like for you. What are you doing? I don't know. I thought, I I don't know. I I did this yesterday afternoon. I've had thoughts since then. I don't know, man. Let me be. What? Uh, Who are your likes? What probability? Well, it's it's Scotty Scheffler. I laid out a case for him already in terms of like how much better he is than everyone else. What's the probability for you if you're opening up? What percentage of your lineups are you going to have Scotty in? 40. Okay. I can live with it. Like he's 18% to win. There are According scenarios in which he wins, but does not, or, you know, does not win, but pays off for DFS. So I think like, yeah, sorry. What are his top three odds in your, I, can you pull that quick or no? No. Okay. Um, we need podium betting in golf. This is terrible. Um, so what, so what, if he finishes fourth, it doesn't matter. If he finishes fourth, he's probably not worth his salary. So, like, that's egregious. Eh, that's a bad so. take. I disagree. That's a bad uh, take. I disagree. Like, <clears throat> I do that a lot for, like, this might be stupid, might be exposing myself, but I use, I use, like, that as a guideline for, like, NASCAR stuff. Like, okay, what are this guy's top 10 odds? I will use that as, like, a guiding light for, like, how heavily I can roster him in DFS. Like, I think that using finishing position odds is a fair way to gauge, like, especially when the salary is 13-2. You're, yes. All I'm going to say is it'd be one thing if he were, like, 10% likely to win. At four to That's one, why I'm saying we, 40% rostered, though, is because, like, you know. Yeah. He's like a borderline like for you, it feels like. And he's a borderline love for me. And I almost feel goofy not having him as a love because of how good he is. We don't have to argue about it anymore. I <laughs> Just circling okay. his salary. What's the, on Fandu, what's the win cost. equity difference between someone at like 94 and 83? Not, no not 10 percentage <laughs> points. I'll tell you that much. But what's the win equity difference between uh, Xander Schauffele and can this young. one in this one hyper specific instance sure but there's more to a lineup than just that i'm, I'm gonna saying. move on <laughs> because we'll spend all day going back and forth i think scheffler should be like a 70 percent play 
maybe like 65 because of how good he is. I think it's really easy to overestimate how much we can predict the non Scheffler golfers and the win equity gap is pretty massive. I'm just, I'm just going to leave it at that. I also like Bryson DeChambeau at 10,500 long off the tee. We know that talked about him already for a top 10. Uh, you know, I frankly would not be surprised if he just gets off to a good start uh, and just, you know, keeps the the pedal down. Jim's building a lineup out here. So a Bryson Neiman Scheffler lineup has 87, 67 left for you. That's mm-hmm. a little bit less than the Rory uh, Xander Neiman, but I feel like it's a big downgrade to go from um, Xander to, to DeChambeau. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, a chef yes, is it doable, feels but that it way, but it's to, a, you, mathematically, <laughs> mathematically, it is a bigger drop from Sheffler to Roy than you're giving credit. <laughs> Just for. in pure win equity, though. Yeah, only one golfer can win. <laughs> they can't but share. It's not like win. It's, you're not picking six guys, and you have to find the winner. What? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you. It's not. It's not binary. Does this guy win or not? If Scheffler finishes third, it's a great result. If he finishes, yeah, that's why I asked you what, what your podium odds were for him. If podium odds existed or podium bets existed, get on your thing, golf. Give up podiums. Come on. I'm gonna continue because you're just gonna aggravate me. I like Russell Henley as well. His salary is 8,700. Kind of mm. helps get to one Scotty Scheffler. Rory Macro. Oh, yeah. Don't you like Russell Henley as well? I guess he's short off the tee. Uh, loses about eight, eight and a half yards uh, per drive on the world average golfer. He's 131st in distance over the last 50 rounds in this field. But we talked about it with that T10 at a longer setup last week, T38 at the Masters. Uh, he can play longer courses and he, this is just his game. It's not like this is all of a, it's not a new thing where he's at a distance disadvantage. And he's a plus on those approaches from 200 plus yards out. My final like. Tom Hoagie, 8,300. We want iron play. Boy, he's got it. Uh, he is just below average in distance. He's 106th in this field, particularly over the last uh, 50 rounds. But get this, 94th percentile over the last calendar year on approaches from 200 plus, And 87th percentile from 150 to 200. Talked about if you're not super long, I want the those long irons. He's got them. He's a great putter. Uh, if, you know, the splits are still a, a positive 58th percentile from within 15 feet this season and four for four and made cuts at PGA championships. Despite the lack of distance, because it's Despite not a new thing. Like you said, with friendly. So, so Tom Hoagie at 83 makes a lot of sense. I won't get there personally, but I cannot push back on it, uh, too much at all. Uh, I had, I don't know. I'm Let's trying hear the excuses. to figure out what? Let's hear the excuses. I tried to figure out where to put Bryson because I like the distance a lot. I like the salary at 10.5 and it's a nice discount. But like the more I think about it, the more I should probably have Xander above him at 11.4. So it sounds uh, like you really just want to build a Rory Xander start. I want to build a Rory and Xander. And you like Neiman. Neiman so much. Rory Xander Neiman. All right. So you get 88.33 if you do that. Yeah. Although I'm going to move Xander down because I know it annoys you to not have the salaries in order. So we're going to put him here, put Rory here, put Neiman there. Okay. We can put Henley, my guy, Dean Burmester. He's a, he's a like 85. And then, oh, I want to get back with the Ben on. That's tragic. All right. Well, I've got some things to deal with at some point here, but I can make it work. Uh, but I think I need to put Xander here. The distance is nice. Upside is nice. I'm getting a lot of win equity at 11-4. So I think when it all comes down to it, Xander Shoffley will be a like for me above DeChambeau. But I'll have lineups where DeChambeau's in there instead just to kind of save because, you know. Yeah, I think I think at a certain point I need to save some salary. So. <laughs> I need to isolate that audio. <laughs> Rather not. Um the and guys that feel bugging a soundboard, and every time you start arguing with me, I'll just <laughs> replicate it. Then, bud, let's get a soundboard <laughs> for you. Like, no, I'm trying to do this three three v three. 
didn't take the bait, which is upsetting. Anyway, my f- official like is Byung Hun An. I I like him a lot at ninety four dollars this week because Ben An is secretly kind of a bomber right now as far as distance goes. His irons are really really good too. We know the issues with the putter, but he doesn't always lose, as he showed last week. I'm pretty sure he led the field in putting last week, which is absurd, but also I think kind of maybe true. Question mark? Can you can can facts be kind of true? Anyway, uh, on was 16th at the Masters. He showed he can do well in major fields. So ninety four hundred dollars to me, very fair salary for Byung Hun On. Another guy we liked, or at least just go ahead. You had a question? No, no, good, good. Raise raise your hand first. No, What's no, your question? Good. No, continue. I had a three v three for you. Okay. Other guy we discussed was it last week we talked to Adam Scott. Yeah, I feel like I talk Adam Scott all the time, honestly. Anyway, he's 91 this week. He's got distance. He can have spike weeks with the irons and the putter. Doesn't have a great track record recently in majors, but he hasn't been like bad either. Irons seem better now than they were entering those most recent majors too. So for 91, I think Scott makes a lot of sense. And I mentioned to Dean Burmester before. He is my final like at $8,500. Playing the live tour right now, but has a lot of distance, which again, we definitely want that for this week. Burmester won Live Miami. He was third in Australia at Adelaide. Uh, he made the cut of the PGA last year, 11th at the Open the year before that. So at least some semblance of a track record in majors. He's very risky because the data on him is limited and he doesn't have the same like long term track record as a Brooks Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau, even Joaquin Neiman. But for 85, I think he does make plenty of sense. So my likes are Dean Burmester, Adam Scott, uh, Byung Hun An, and Xander Schauffele slash Bryson DeChambeau. We'll figure that one out. Okay, what's your 3v3? So it's really a 2v2, but to make it, to give it proper context, I'm going to throw Neiman in here. Okay. Uh, you said you like Tommy Fleetwood, right? Enough. Scotty Scheffler, Tommy Fleetwood, uh-huh. and Joaquin Neiman. Get you 88.67 left per golfer. Rory, Xander, and Neiman get you 88.33. I'm taking Rory, You're Xander, le- Neiman. Really? Yeah. I want that juice, man. You're. <laughs> I want two juices, not just one juice. You want you want two half juices instead of one full juice how is rory a half juice he's plus 750 to win like you can disagree with the betting odds but like the betting odds are there for a reason like you keep saying double the win equity uh plot odds plus 750 are oh gosh my calculator is working slow uh, 11 it's like 11 yeah late eight and uh four to one is is 20 percent. that's not double bro it's close but it's not double so i'm just saying and Xander again is seventy five percent to win, so like I'd rather get him. In <laughs> yeah, there. you keep falling back to that, but it's true. And w- the the hardest part is I like all three, and I like yeah. Brooks. Um, do you like Brooks so what all? percentage yeah, we have of Rory? Ten lineups. How many is Rory in? If you Realistic, say zero, I'm quitting. Probably two. not the now you're gonna say just so I quit. Rude, <laughs> stupid. Right, probably, probably two because I'm that much higher on Scotty, and I think that okay. it's worth it getting there. Okay. Yeah. Can we make up both? <laughs> uh Scotty plus Rory is aggressive. 8675. I don't think I can do that, but um you'd need you'd need Hoagie. Consider yeah. like Soderberg. Uh Patrick Rogers at like 75. Or 70 what's he? 76? 76. Yeah. Uh Eric Van Royen is 78. I could do I that. mean, you you realistically need like two guys below 80, 85, and then you can make it work. It's you not like Eric like Van Royen or no. Uh, I I'm not quite there anymore with him. I just don't see it enough like I used to. Hmm. Despite a fourth at the prestigious Myrtle Beach Classic yes. this past week, it's it's definitely not bad. Um, I although. I know we're I know it's long, but it's a major here. And I think okay. it's worth discussing. And frankly, the DFS discussion this week is really fascinating because yeah. of the win equity among the top three. Would you consider 
like the way that I get more Rory is if I go Scheffler, Rory, or like Scheffler, Xander, and then cycle through like those values and just say, I believe so much in Scotty and Rory and or Xander that I think they're going to finish like, well, I know for you, if they don't finish first, then they're useless up there at those salaries. I said top but... three at 13 too. It's not about the other guys. It's about him specifically because he has a very high salary and salary matters. Would you consider having your core actually just be like Scotty and Rory and then kind of just like, like almost locking them in more or less and yes. cycling through and just saying like not those two in the same lineup, but like. So then we're not on the same page then. Oh, so you're saying like, like if you have those, Rory, just like have those two locked into every single lineup, like in this thought experiment, like if you go Scotty Rory and you're like, OK, you named like four or five names yeah. in the 85 or lower range and you're like, I'm just going to cycle through and hope to get the right combo there without over because then you're not like, well, I need some Rom or I need some yeah. Brooks or whatever. I, I think, that's, I think, I think that we should be approach. more receptive to that approach in general. Probably. I probably won't do that this week, but I think like in general, it's a fine approach. Like, you know, because like your mindset playing DFS is I have to be okay losing this entry fee. And like, you should probably be okay losing all your entry fees. So like, why not just shoot for the upside and hope that you, you know, hope that you're right in like that assumption. Yeah. And it, I mean, it also, we should clarify, this is like a more of a tournament approach oh, yeah, of yeah. trying to hit the right core. Uh, if you're playing a double up or head to head, are you more likely to get the Scheffler or no? Mm-mm. Well, more likely, yes. Okay, but I, I think that I'm going to be on on Rory there. Like, okay. he's a better play in a head to head or double up than he is in a tournament. But I'm still probably going to use Rory there regardless. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Uh, okay. So to recap, oh, we did the recap. Okay, win picks. For this week, I'm still in the top 10s in this tab. You dummy. Okay. Win picks for the PGA Championship. I'll let you go first. I'm sticking with my guys. I, Xander and Brooks? I, I like a long shot. It really feels like... I mean, it really feels like Scotty again. But if not Scotty, I think it's going to take a fully complete game to take down either Scotty or if Rory's really locked in. For Brooks, Xander, I think it's going to be one of the the favorites this week, honestly. Okay, so you got Xander Shoffle at 14 to 1 and Brooks Kepka at 16 to 1. I'm going to take the golfers who are ranked counting fifth and sixth in data golf's true strokes gained the past six months. Those guys are Joaquin Neiman. That one's no surprise based on what we discussed. 35 to 1. Number six is John Rahm, the exact same approach I had at the Masters. I'm pretty sure the exact same win picks I had as well for the masters, but thought process again is <clears throat> Rom's odds are long because he hasn't been discussed very much, but he's still playing good golf. That past six month number includes only his live events and the masters and the masters. He finished 45th in large part due to bad putting, but the approach play was good. He's had consistently good finishes in the live tour, good distance as well. And he's still John Rom. So I think it's 16 to one. That's a good spot to buy in. So my win picks John Rom 16 and Joaquin Neiman at 35. No issues with the logic. There are every time we do a major, there are names we have to just gloss over, even though we ran long, like longer than typical. It's a really fun, intriguing event. And we had to argue. We don't argue enough anymore. I know we did. We to fly through things, but you know, sometimes we got to get an old school make Brandon mad um, key check argument. Yeah. Any final argument. thoughts for you before we close up shop for today? <laughs> thoughts. I just got to wait till we're <laughs> off there. No, uh, pretty typical post like end of major pod. Um, there are going to be some names that we don't dig into and you might like. You're probably in a major field, pretty validated with liking a lot of these names. Uh, but I think that there are a few core plays with Scotty Xander. And as much as I prefer those two in DFS to Rory due to the salary, either being higher or lower, I, I do love Rory um, all the same. So it's just one of those weeks. And uh, I think uh, Xander got on a limb. I think he tops tens at least. <laughs> <laughs> 
Gwen on a limb for the plus 140 bet. Good job. That was, that was job. the bait and switch. Because he top 10's everything. Yeah. It would be bad for me in win picks if he won, but I want money, actual money. So I'm hoping he does win, uh, personally. That is all that we have here for today on the Heat Check. But as mentioned, we are here every single Tuesday breaking down that week's PGA Tour events. We don't always argue this much, but maybe we should, you know, just uh, maybe, maybe. But come back uh, for us each and every single week by subscribing to the FanDuel Research Podcast feed. Wherever you get your podcast, you can, of course, find the show as well over on uh, FanDuel TV+. Plus. Brandon, if people have questions for you on Twitter, where can they find you there? I'm on Twitter at Gadula13, G-D-U-L-A-1-3. And I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can also find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets and DFS lineups. Enjoy the golf. We'll talk to you all once again next week. This has been the Heat Check right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.